Well, I'm really grateful to be a part, part of this conference against war and capitalism, and I'm very proud to be a part of the only movement on the planet that's taken the initiative to provide a counteroffensive against war. As a candidate for the Socialist Equality Party in West Virginia's House District 16, I ran on a platform that was anti-war, against inequality, and against attacks on democratic rights. Um, I just want to take a moment, actually, to thank all the comrades and supporters, uh, some of who are here today, uh, who helped in this effort. Um, SEP presidential candidate Jerry White, uh, vice presidential candidate Niles Nemeth, E.P. Bannon, Zach Corrigan, Kara Sikhan, Phyllis Scherer, Lawrence Porter, and many others traveled to campaign in West Virginia. And I'm certain that they'll agree with what I had to say about the character of the working class in America. Uh, but I especially want to thank Clement Daly, the World Socialist website reporter in West Virginia, who went out on a daily basis after work, has gone door to door to thousands of houses with me, uh, held countless meetings on war, socialism, global economy, and many other topics, um, and worked persistently to help reach the working class. In one sense, this conference and the um, election is a culmination of, of that effort, but in a more profound sense, it really represents the beginning of a new phase in this work. Uh, over the last six months, um, we've campaigned in the working class in and around the city of Huntington, West Virginia. This is a small industrial city in the heart of central Appalachia. It's the rail center of the southern coal fields, and it's been hit really hard by the collapse in coal. Huntington um, made its name in national news last year because it's the epicenter of the really horrendous heroin epidemic. Uh, um, areas of the state are now classified as being not just in recession, but in depression. The state's been mired in terrible budget shortfall for years now, and um, public employees are being attacked, services are being cut, infrastructure is dangerously neglected, schools are being shuttered, and even community colleges are being eyed for closure. Um, communities are really vulnerable to the repeated flash flooding like what we saw in June, um, mudslides. These are problems typically associated with the developing world, not the so-called richest country on earth. How did we get into a situation where roads can slide down hillsides and chemical companies can ruin the water supply, ambulance services are eliminated, where kids have to ride a bus for hours to go to school in FEMA trailers? where there's no dentist and you have to wait 12 hours in a parking lot to be seen by charity clinics under tents. This is the new normal. This is capitalism in 2016, in the richest country in the world. These are the first world problems. Appalachia um, has always been presented as somehow different than the rest of the country, as a place uh, out of time, a pocket of poverty, um, that's the product of some kind of cultural preference of the population itself. Appalachians and white Southerners in general are the last segment of the population that are considered fair game for ridicule and stereotyping. And they're presented as racist, religious bigots, white trash who sponge off the system and enjoy living in squalor. In fact, within West Virginia and Kentucky, uh, this narrative is put forward off by the better off layers especially liberals, for two reasons. One, to blame the poor for their problems, and two, to carve out a lucrative niche of, quote, Appalachian solutions to these problems, usually involving corporate tax breaks, deregulation, and law and order. The global economic crisis, however, reals, reveals a real, the real relationship uh, of forces, and West Virginia's economic fate is intimately bound up with the capitalist system itself and with the historic decline of American capitalism. As a handful of people have hoarded extreme wealth, millions of Americans have been forced into extreme poverty. Inequality, exploitation, and repression are the order of the day. During uh, the SCP campaign over the summer, I petitioned to get onto the ballot. SCP campaigners would tell people we're intervening in this election to give the working class an independent political voice. We spoke to thousands of people about the need for a break with the Democrats and Republicans. We said, these parties represent the rich, they stand for war, for inequality, they're violating your democratic rights, your interests lie with peace, equality, and democracy. 
That's socialism, not capitalism. This resonated with many people. One person told me he didn't know a lot about socialism, but he knew what he didn't want. And this is a quote. He said, I cannot support a political platform where the rich get more and more and children go to bed hungry at night, where we're bought and sold to the highest bidder every day, year after year. It's my belief that if they could pay us in cold scrip and have us spend our lives owning the company store, they would. We heard again and again, good luck, I hope you win, we need you. I heard a few hell rights and, and a couple of hallelujahs too. We, we actually, we collected six times the number of required signatures to get onto the ballot. It was a very powerful response. And of course, getting onto the ballot was not that easy. Um, we submitted hundreds of signatures and I was certified to run. And then in September, the Secretary of State dumped every independent politician off the ballot on completely spurious grounds. The state retroactively moved the filing deadline back to the earliest state ever seen in the country. It was blatantly unconstitutional. And there were people, supporters, um, contacts who saw this happen. They were completely indignant. A warehouse worker called the Democrats, quote, bloated money and power hungry cowards. He said, the fact that they're attempting to restrict your ballot access should be taken as a compliment. We filed a lawsuit against the Secretary of State in federal court and we won. And this was important. It was a very important experience. It's significant, though, that it took the only socialist candidate in the state to fight for basic democratic rights of the voting public. Defending democratic rights is one of the central planks of the Socialist Equality Party's election platform. The socialists mean what they say. And that was, that was important for workers to see. Um, there was an electrician that we met um, who saw me the week after the court hearing, and he said, hey there, TV star, I seen you on the news, I told my buddy, I know that gal. He was very proud, and he was glad that we stood up for the right to vote for candidates beyond the Democrats and Republicans. And people we met campaigning said that they were proud of, of the party. There was a sense that they were on the right side with us and the sense that to be on the right side was to be politically independent from the establishment, which was actively trying to clamp down on democracy. This is part of an experience of the working class in the last year. The campaign of Bernie Sanders uh, resonated with millions of people who were looking for something progressive and outside of the establishment politics that people like Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama represent. The collapse of Sanders' campaign um, amid reports of fraud and suppression by the Democratic Party, then Sanders' endorsement of Clinton left a really bitter taste in people's mouths. And in a, a very real sense, uh, they felt that the electoral process in America is rigged. It is. And, it, you know, in many areas, the poorest areas of West Virginia, Sanders had won by a landslide in the primary. In some counties, he got more than the combined vote totals for Clinton and Trump. Um, and it was clear that people were looking for something genuinely in their class interests. SCP um, campaigners attended a Sanders rally in Huntington. Uh, thousands of people had traveled for hours from remote areas. They were waiting in a really long line, stretching for blocks outside of the arena. And inside, there were all types of people. There were, you know, young people, elderly, um, white collar professionals, students, people showing up wearing work uniforms and nursing scrubs, carrying their kids in tow. And we spoke to people who were not diehard Bernie Sanders supporters, but they come because they were curious. Some had never voted before, and they said that the region was written off by politicians, but this one had bothered to come, so they wanted to come see what he had to say. So Sanders, uh, you know, gave his standard stump speech. He was railing against the billionaire class and Wall Street. And at one point in talking about inequality, he remarked on the fact that McDowell County, West Virginia, had a life expectancy for men about 20 years less than in a Washington, D.C. suburb. And he said that poverty didn't just mean that people couldn't buy a big screen TV or a boat or something like that, but it meant Poverty meant taking years off of your life. And the crowd started booing 
and stomping. And Sanders, you know, motioned with his hands to quiet them down, but the yelling went on. And then he started to speak and he had to stop because it was deafening. And from where we were on the floor of the arena, it seemed as if the Sanders people were in danger of losing control of the anger that was being aroused. Sanders was, you know, looking around at other people standing by the stage. People were absolutely enraged about the issue of inequality. And the class tensions were really palpable. The preference um, for Sanders over Clinton in the West Virginia primary was chalked up to sexism by the upper middle class liberals. And the vote for Trump, um, the supposed anti-establishment figure, was the white man angry over the loss of his privilege. Not angry over the inability to eat or work or over depression conditions or the loss of 20 years off of his life, but privilege. From the liberals, there's a demand that the working class accept the collapse in its living conditions. In fact, to them, the right to a decent job or to a retirement or health care is privilege. It's not a right. If you think about it, President Obama's signature policies like restructuring the auto industry or Obamacare is about gutting living standards, cutting wages in half, attacking pensions, limiting health care, denying procedures like cancer screenings, effectively lowering the life expectancy of the white working class. And <laughs> liberals are calling now for a national service and physical fitness programs and stuff to help the military get more combat-ready recruits. Instead of good jobs or an education, young people are told to go into the military. Both young and old people are smeared as being entitled for wanting basic things. There's a, um, a really vicious satisfaction from the wealthy layer of the population in seeing the suffering in former industrial and mining strongholds like in West Virginia. The fake radicals around the Democratic Party uh, take an almost bloodthirsty glee in seeing the white working class being attacked. And they don't even hide it. One representative from the Democrat-oriented Workers' World Party told me, quote, white people are too fat. They need to lose a lot more. Our campaign is a direct confrontation to that. We fight for the international working class, including in Appalachia. We understand that the working class is revolutionary because it creates all the wealth in society. And I've had old, poor, and yes, obese, ill health people say, thank you for caring about us. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you for not writing us off. The working class is increasingly alienated from the Democrats and Republicans. Frequently, the first question I ask people while out campaigning is, are you following the presidential elections? Who are you voting for? I've asked hundreds of people this, and I really wish I'd taken a video of every facial expression I've gotten in response. Because if you ask people what they think of Clinton and Trump, the response is one of virtually universal disgust, outrage, exasperation, even embarrassment, a lot of nose wrinkling, groaning, the most common answer, by the way, is I don't like either of them. Many have just said, I'm not going to vote. Others said they would hold their nose and vote for Clinton or vice versa. Trump supporters were often reluctant, saying they didn't like the man, that he was something outside of Washington. At least he's his own man. Um, the Democrat and Republican parties are in a crisis. In West Virginia, the protest vote is increasingly a popular recourse for people who are disenfranchised by the establishment. One in five voters is now registered independent. People don't have all the answers, but they're looking. And they're tired of austerity and the idea that there's no money to meet basic needs. When we point out that trillions of, do of dollars have been spent on war in the last 15 years, trillions of dollars have been handed out to the banks, working people are given a perspective where their grievances click into place. When we note that millions of miners and steelworkers in China are losing their jobs just like workers here, the nationalist lies of the coal bosses and the political establishment, including the unions, falls flat. Chinese workers are not our enemies, they are our allies. War benefits the rich, not the working class. As social conditions deteriorate, it becomes more evident that there's no local solution to problems that are global and systemic in origins. The proposals of the socialists 
will look more practical and realistic than those of the capitalists. Democratic rights must be actively fought for through a mass movement. Equality is more rational than a system that permits 60 people to own more than 3.5 billion people. Peace and international collaboration make sense. Nuclear annihilation does not. These choices will not, will not only be more and more clear cut to the working class, but they will present themselves with extreme urgency. This is the basis on which the unity of the working class must be forged and to which the American workers will devote their immense courage and strength. Thank you.